Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day, fathers. Happy Father's Day to everybody that has a father. And if you do or don't, living or not living, you do have a heavenly father. Um, it was perfect. It was an awesome father. Great example. And, uh, you know, it's, it is very awesome to be able to be a father, you know, to be a dad and, and uh, raise kids up. But, man, it is also um, just scary, man. It's a, big, it's a big thing, you know. Um, and I'm, one of the things that I'm so grateful to God for is the fact that he can even take care of the things that I mess up because I mess them up quite a bit. And he still just whoop, does his God thing and, and works through it anyway. Man, that is so awesome. Um, one of my bookmarks, you can't see it, but there's cute little, uh, writing on here. There's me and then one of my daughters, and this is from May of 2015 when my wife and I decided to let our three daughters go to Canada to spend the summer with my mom. Um, who knew how hard that would be? Like, I was thinking freedom, all this stuff. No, like almost immediately. It was like, ah, where are my kids? Come back. Um, but she left me this little bookmark. It says, Dear Daddy, I will miss you while I'm gone. I hope you will have a good summer. Love, Azrael. And um, I'm telling you, like, it's super hard just to read that without just starting to choke up and stuff, even still. But anyhow, how about that, uh, that worship? I mean, you know, we can come up here and we can just play some videos on the screen but we still get to enter into his presence. You know, he meets us where we are because we, we worship him. We love him. We want to, uh, want to just give everything to him. And, and I don't get to sit up here and, or stand up here and worship with you guys very often because a lot of times I'm in the back. And if anybody ever looks back there, they see me bouncing around, hopping around. My hands are up. I'm usually crying or something, snotty face and everything. So it's probably good that I'm back there. But um, it's so fun to be able to be in the midst of you guys, you know, and actually worshiping our Savior. And some of the, the words of the songs today, I mean, and every day, but today they were really hitting home. And, and with where we're going through Romans, you know, we're only hitting chapter 4 today. But where we've already been, where we're going with Romans, this is so fitting. Like one of, the, one of the verses says, be the ransom for my soul. Um, hopefully I'll be able to make it through this whole sermon today without losing it. But um, he is the ransom for our souls. He is. That's who he is. Man. Another one says, you're never going to let me down. He can't let us down. He, he would never let us down. He can't. Says you are holy and worthy to be praised. He is holy. He is worthy. To be praised. He's worthy of our praise. Everything that we do. Like, I know whenever I was growing up, like, I'd come into a worship service and I'd be afraid to raise my hands. I'd be afraid to sing out. I'd be afraid to whatever because of what other people are thinking. It doesn't matter what other people think, it doesn't make the slightest difference about what somebody else thinks about you in worship. Nothing. It makes no difference. None. And if you find yourself taking the time out of worshiping and praising your God that created the universe to judge the way someone else is worshiping, shame on you and don't ever do it again. You know? Just as easy as that. All we have to do whenever we come in here 
and we're worshiping because He is holy and He is worthy to be praised is to think about the fact that He is holy and He's literally worthy to be praised by you. Man, I, I'm going to bounce around. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to sing loud and probably off key or out of tune or whatever. I'm sorry. Try to block it out and just worship. Let go of everything else. Let go of any of your preconceived notions of what this needs to look like and just worship Him. Let it all go. Let it all out. I think we should all be dancing around like fools, you know, if that's what you want to do. I, just worship Him. However, oh my goodness. It says, He who was and is and is to come. That's why He's so worthy. He was before you. He is now and He's going to be here after you leave this earth. Fortunately, when we leave this earth, we get to enter into the worship service. The worship. Oh, man. Woo! Can't wait for that. That's all those notes. All right. Today, we're going over Romans chapter 4, and I have like a subtitle of Faith That Saves, but... Before we can roll into Romans chapter 4, because Paul starts out like 4, he didn't make the chapters, we did. And so this is just a continuation on. So we're going to recap a little bit of chapter 3, um, hit some highlights so that as we roll into chapter 4, it kind of makes, it, it still makes sense. I know you guys were here last week and stuff, but we're going we're gonna to hit a little bit of it. So you can turn to chapter 3 if you want. You don't have to. You can if you'd like. That's where we're going to be kicking off, but I titled it Faith That Saves, and you'll understand why shortly. Jesus. Everything that we're covering today is about Jesus. It's truly about Jesus. That's what it's about. He is the lover of your souls. He's the lover of my soul. Think about that in your own mind. Think. Jesus is the lover of my soul, because He is. The Father God loves you so much, created you, wanted you. So be thinking about that as we go through all of this, okay? Jesus, the lover of my soul. Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will just reveal your word to us, God. Reveal your will to us today, Lord. Reveal to us exactly what it is that you want us to receive from your word today. God, make your word plain. Make it clear. Your word says that your Holy Spirit teaches us all things, reveals all things to us, God. And I pray that that is exactly what you will do to everyone at the sound of my voice. Lord, I pray that you will speak through me today, God. That it's not me that they hear, but you that they hear, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we will just receive this word from you, that it will be rooted, buried deep down in our hearts and in our souls, that it will penetrate us to the core, and that we will come away from today with a new understanding and revelation and love of, of you, and an understanding and revelation and love of what you have for us and why you did what you did and laid this path out for us, God. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. So the gospel. You know, Paul starts out Romans saying that this is his gospel. Well, what is gospel? It's not, it's not the gospel of Paul. It's the gospel, and what gospel is is the good news, right? It's the good news, the teaching or revelation of Christ. That's what Paul is, is giving to the Romans. The good news, the revelation or knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. It's everything. It is literally everything. That is what this is all about. It's why we're here. It's what keeps us pressing on is this revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul, he uses the Old Testament. He uses these Old Testament scriptures through a, a post-Christ framework, through an understanding that they're talking about Christ. 
the Old Testament literally is leading up to Christ. And that's what Paul does here. He uses this and helps us in our own Christology. Christology is kind of a weird word. We probably haven't used it here a whole lot. But what it means is the Christian theology relating to the person, nature, and role of Christ. That's what Christology is. Okay? And so Paul, the way he breaks everything down is literally, he was, he was the Jew of all Jews, right? I mean, he, he literally lived, breathed, walked, talked, everything, Judaism. He was a phenomenal Jew. And so once Paul had this encounter with Jesus Christ, everything came together. Have you ever studied something and you knew that this plus this equals this or whatever, but then one day you understood why. And then it's like, everything just opens up to you. And you're like, oh, wow, that's why. I use a math term. Don't think that I know math. Like That didn't necessarily happen to me in math. But, but that's what happened with Paul through understanding all of the Torah, all of the law, all the scriptures, once Jesus met him on the road and revealed himself to him, and then he started to understand, you know, the Holy Spirit just started putting all these pieces together. It's amazing how teachers and how theologians and stuff, they look at Paul's writings and they're like, Paul's making up his own theology. Paul's tearing this apart. Paul's, he's gone off the rails. He hasn't gone off any rails. What he's done is he's viewing everything in the Old Testament through the work of Christ. Christ is the Messiah that they were actually looking for. Even though the Messiah, uh, how do you say Messiah in the Old Testament? Meshach or something like that? Sorry. Um, if you take that term and you really start to look at it and you're trying to find Jesus in just that term alone, it's really, in fact, you're probably not going to come to the conclusion that Jesus is that actual true proven Messiah. That's, you're probably not going to come to that conclusion because you have to take the totality of the scriptures and put them together to truly actually understand that, right? So, um, Paul fully believed that Jesus was Messiah, that he truly was the one that was going to be the Savior of the world, that was bringing all of this back together. Paul understands that faith and faithfulness and Torah, keeping the Torah, he understands that, that all of that is necessary, but he's able to contextualize the Old Testament in light of the work of Jesus and his encounter with him on the road. So it's just incredible. Um, if you start to break down uh, the Jewish culture and the Messiah, the messianic um, uh, words that were coming forth, you know, that, that are scattered throughout the entire Old Testament, then you can start to put together like a, a messianic profile, essentially, to help you to truly understand that Jesus really is the real risen Messiah, that he really is the one that God was planning on saving the world through. And so if you, if you break it down and you look at it, it's made up of multiple different things, not just, not just by trying to follow the Messiah through the Old Testament. You have to look at things like the seed, right? You have to look at things like the offspring, the dynasty, the kingship, family, servanthood, prophet, priest, son of man, son of God, a messenger, you know, like all of those things, if you really start to pull all those together, then you start getting a more well-rounded picture. And then it's like, boom, it's just Jesus slaps you in the face like this. It's clear. There's nothing else. This is, this is the one, you know, it's incredible. So I say all that um, simply because if, if you just read the Old Testament without trying to picture Jesus in the Old Testament, and then you see Paul's writings, you're going to think, what in the world? 
But we look at it from, from our own perspective today, right? We don't look at it from a second temple um, uh, understanding, a Jewish understanding from that second temple, temple period like Paul was. And so if we start to break all this down and we start looking at, at Romans, and in Romans, Paul uses the Old Testament so many times. I mean, it's, it's almost just Old Testament scripture repeated over and over, you know? But I love the way that he breaks it down for us. So, chapter 3 of Romans is really about how to get right with God. Okay, so if you remember, I, I kind of brought a twist as, as in, um, we're going to look at Romans 1, 2, and 3 as people being on trial. We're going to look at the sinless. The God or the sinful, the God uh, godless. We're going to look at the righteous. You know, the Jews, the godless are the uncircumcised in the scriptures, and the righteous are are the circumcised because they're following the law. And we're we're looking at all that and we're breaking it down. And, and really, it was putting the whole world on trial. It was putting the whole world on trial. That's why I said anybody can get offended at what we were going to read there in the first couple chapters, right? Well, chapter 3 is so incredible. It's, it's absolutely so incredible. I'm jealous that you got to cover it, but there's a few things that I'm going to go back over and hit real quick. And chapter 3 really is about how to get right with God, and right is righteousness, righteousness. And, and Pastor Rod talked about it being a right standing with God. To, to be righteous is having a right standing with God. Okay, and, and to be righteous and have that right standing is the only way that we can get to heaven. It's the only way we can get to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but through me. That means he's the one that brings righteousness. He's the one that makes you righteous. We're going to lay it out and we're going to prove it. So, first Paul's showing us that, that none of us are right. That none of us are in a right standing with God because nothing that we do makes us right. Nothing that we can possibly do makes us the righteousness in order to get us there. So that's why Paul was breaking that down. He took all of us to court and he identifies, I love how in chapter 3 he identifies the human arguments. You'll recognize that, that in 3 verse 1 it says, well then what, what advantages are there of being a Jew or circumcision. Basically, the Jews are saying, and, and Paul was kind of uh, ad-libbing for them, knowing that these are questions in their minds, right? And basically, that question is, why are we chosen if we get judged the same as the godless, if we get judged as the same as the uncircumcised? You know, why, why are we the chosen people if you're telling us that, that we're wrong too, that we've sinned too? Well, Paul goes on and says, there's much, there's much in every way, much advantage in, in every way. He says that Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, and you can, Paul really lays that out more in chapters 9 through 11, so we'll really cover more of that later, but then he goes on and he says, um, the godless say, what if some are unfaithful? What he's talking about there is the hypocrites. That's what he's, that's what he means whenever he says, what if some are unfaithful, though? Well, how can they, and basically, how can we trust that God is faithful when His people are clearly unfaithful? Have you ever heard of that? People not going to church because they're full of hypocrites? You know? Well, how can we trust this God because all of His people, they aren't, they aren't people that I want to be around. How can we trust Him if, if these people don't look like that? That's why it's so desperately important that we walk like God, we talk like God, we have this relationship with Him, that we're invested in this relationship with Him and we look like that. Well, basically, Paul says, will, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Well, just because of the fact that they're not faithful, will that mean that God Himself is, is not faithful as well? And he says, absolutely not, not at all. Let God be true and every human a liar. Listen, guys, no matter what people do, God is still true. No matter what people do, God is still true. 
We have to truly understand that. People might hurt you. They might let you down. But God is still true, and he's not. If hypocrites were your judge, that would not be fair. But they're not. God is your judge, and God is fair. You've always heard these, the saying, only God can judge me. It, it's, it seems like people that say that sometimes, and I don't know their hearts, but it seems like whenever people say that, it's like, um, it's almost like they feel like that they're never going to get judged by God. You know, they can do whatever they want. Only God's going to judge me. And it's like they don't even care what that outcome is. You know, that's, uh, that's dangerous. It's a slippery slope. And it, it, I think that it causes them to um, uh, kind of stay in, in the lifestyle that they're in. It's very dangerous. But that, uh, that quote there came from Chris Langham from Through the Word. He's a pastor that wrote a really cool app. He was the one that said, if hypocrites were your judge, that would not be fair, but they're not. God is your judge, and God is fair. And then whenever you move into um, the next question that Paul addresses, he says, if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness, then God judging me isn't fair. After all, I'm only human, you know? If, if that's the case, if our unrighteousness brings out His righteousness, then it's not fair for Him to judge me. Well, that's kind of a, a really a very foolish defense because if that's the case and that's the standpoint that people want to take, then truly what they're telling God is don't ever judge any evil. Don't. Don't judge evil, you know, because it's, it would be unfair to me. Well, that's just absolutely ridiculous. So, Paul lays out that everyone's under sin. We're all under, under the power of sin, right? Everybody at this point in this in this court hearing, if, it, if you will, then everyone was guilty because everyone was under the power of sin. And Paul throws out the Scripture. He says, as it is written, there's not one that's righteous, not even one. If everyone was guilty, then what was the point of the law? If everyone was guilty, really, what was the point of the law? Like they... They really stood on this law. Everything was, had to be by the book, right? Follow every single law, every single one, and do it right. Well, he goes through and he lays it out in, in verse 19 through 20. Um, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. That last little spot was what really lays it out for us. The whole law wasn't put together to make us right, to make us righteous. It was put together so that we would be conscious of the fact that we need a Savior. Because we can't uphold the law. No one can. The law can't make you good, so its purpose is to help you know that you're not good. What Paul's doing here is he's using the Holy Scriptures to prove its purpose so that we know we can never earn it. It's not something that we can earn. It's not something we can earn. I love how he lays this out. So in a court hearing, essentially, this is where the sentencing would come. You know, everybody's guilty. Now time for the sentencing. Chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, may be some of the absolute most important verses in the entire Bible. That's a big statement, isn't it? That's a huge statement. What do you mean, Nathan? <laughs> some of the most important verses in the entire Bible? Let's read verse 24 real quick. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, please understand that, that I'm not somebody that takes one scripture and tries to build all this theology on, on one scripture. I'm absolutely not whatsoever. But what I do want to prove and, and 
draw out here of these scriptures is Jesus' redemption for all of us through this. So let's look at 21. Righteousness of God through faith. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned, all of us, and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption That is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, basically as the sacrifice, by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is, this is incredible. So redemption, what redemption is? Redemption, Jesus bought your freedom. He paid the full price. That's what it's saying. He bought your freedom and paid the full price for it. This was his atonement for us, and atonement means at one mint. It means it's brought together. It's brought back together. Atonement. It's brought back together. So think about whenever, um, basically when you're not right with your spouse or a friend or whatever, and you know that it's your fault, you know that you're the one that was wrong, and you, you wish you would do anything to make it right again. Anything. Because you know it was your fault. That's what atonement is. It's God making that right again. It's Him making that way for you to be right. And that's exactly what He does here. So, it also says to justify us. If God is righteous, He has to punish sin. Right? If He's righteous, He has to punish sin. How can sin go on unpunished? And But that's where we trip up. That's where we fall. And we're like, well... I've been in sin. I've I've sinned. I'm a sinner. But if you stop there, then you're done. You're stuck. You're dead. You're done. But that's not where it stops, okay? Because God's righteous, He has to punish sin. So as to be just and to justify, what it said there in the last verse, it said to be just and to justify those of us who have faith in Jesus. He will justify you. He has justified you. If you have faith in Jesus, you you are justified from Him. Justify means to declare righteous or to make good. That's what to justify means. So how can God be both just and forgiving? How can He be good if He justifies bad people? He does punish. And Jesus took the punishment. His punishment has been divvied out. It's been given out. And Jesus took it. (laughs) Jesus took it for you. And you're like, but I deserve it. It's mine. You can't hold on to it. He took it from you. It's no longer yours. Therefore, He is just to forgive. He forgives us, and he's, He is justified in forgiving you. Isn't that awesome? He's justified in forgiving you. All right. That's pretty much chapter 3. Recap. Let's jump into Romans chapter 4. You can turn there with me if you'd like. Romans chapter 4. So, Paul's laying out that everyone sinned, but he also lays out 
that we've all been justified as long as we have faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Where you're not justified is if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, God doesn't want anyone to perish. That means He doesn't want anyone to die without knowing Him. No one, not even one person, the people that you like, the people that you don't like. He doesn't want any of them to die without a relationship with Him. And if they are willing to believe, they will receive. Think of the, the sinner on the cross next to Jesus, right? They call him a thief. There's, there's several different things. Some of them say that they were murderers and all this stuff. Nevertheless, they're sinners and their, their punishment deserved death. And in this conversation, they're mocking Jesus. And then one of them realizes, wait a second. Something's totally different about this dude. And the, the other one's still over there running his mouth. He's like, hey, shut up, man. What are you thinking? Like, we deserve to be hanging here, but he doesn't. And the other one just doesn't get it. Just refuses to believe that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. But the one that does, there's nothing that shows that he ever did anything good in his whole life. Not ever. He didn't grow up in church that we know of. He didn't get water baptized. He didn't go out and evangelize. He didn't, you know, get rid of all of his secular music and stuff. He's literally on his deathbed. He's dying. I think I just spit. Sorry if I hit you, Jesse. Just wipe it off. Good to go. Wipe it off. Water off a duck's back. But literally, he's hanging up there dying. He's being murdered. And he realizes that Jesus is who he says he is. He realizes that this man, literally going through the same thing as me, only clearly worse. He was obviously beaten so bad he was shredded. This guy didn't have to go through all that. He's looking at Jesus like, and realizing this is God. This is God in flesh. And he acknowledges that. He believes it. He acknowledges it. And Jesus says, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Oh, what? Just like that. Just like that. Woo! So, that brings us into Romans chapter 4, verse 1. So Paul, and remember Paul, Jesus told, Jesus told, uh, I believe it was Ananias, he said, go to Paul, or Saul, he's staying uh, on Straight Street. And he's like, well, you got to be kidding me, I can't go see that dude, like he's literally out killing Christians, like he's rounding us up. And Jesus says, no, 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 he needs to know how much he has to suffer for me. Saul, that day, met Jesus on the road, and it changed his life. You know, he was blind for three days. God put scales on his eyes. Scales on his eyes. That's weird. Um, but put scales on his eyes and blinded him, and nothing he could do. And I'm thinking about these three days that he literally was blind and not, not able to see. He couldn't, you know how... You might experience something, but whenever you're looking at the world through these eyes that allow you to see colors and, and movement and all this stuff, like eventually it kind of dulls what you just experienced. You're hearing things, you're seeing things, you're experiencing things. He didn't eat either, you know, through those three days, but he couldn't see. So nothing is distracting him really. Nothing's coming in these portals to distract him. So all he's doing is focusing on this Jesus who he met and he had an experience that there's no denying his experience. Like anybody could tell him, no, you didn't experience it. But he's like, no, I experienced it. You can't take it away from me. I know. Well, for instance, look at the scales on my eyes. I literally can't see anything. I didn't do that to myself. No one else experienced the same thing. So he has these three days where he's just literally 
going over and over and over what this supernatural experience that he just had was. He's trying to figure it out. But because he knows the word so well, and he says, Jesus said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Ooh, that had to rock him to the, to the core. Yet he's still laying there on the ground like, uh, because I don't know if you remember, he got knocked down too and blinded. Um, so he says, go tell Paul, you know, all this time, Saul, all this time, Saul at the time is literally trying to process through what he just experienced. And now he's had this experience with Jesus. He knows he didn't do anything to earn this Jesus experience. He followed everything, the letter of the law to the to the T. But he knew none of that was going to bring him into salvation. Now he thought he thought so, but then as soon as he met Jesus, he realized I was wrong. I was wrong. And that's what he's doing here. He's laying this out showing that you know what? I was wrong. But now I understand why and let me show you what God revealed to me. And that's what he's doing here. That's what he's doing in chapter 4 because he's getting a lot of resistance. You would get a lot of resistance from all the religious leaders. Who else got resistance? Do you remember anybody that got resistance from the religious leaders in the Bible? One, one main guy. Jesus. Yeah, exactly. They, I mean, they, they murdered him. So that was some resistance. Um, but... Paul is stepping out and saying, check this out. Check this out. And he went first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Just like God told him to. He's trying to get people to understand. And so now he's speaking to the, the Christians in Rome. And he says, you know, he goes through chapter 3. And he, let, me, let me wrap up chapter 3. Like I'll read the last uh, couple verses for you. It says, Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? That was a great question. Is the God that created every single human on the planet and created the planet himself and everything on it is he just the God of just the Jews? Or is he God of all, the, of all the people that he created? I love that he throws that question out there. He says, Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Of the sinners, the, the godless, those that aren't Jews. Yes, of Gentiles only. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? No, by no means. On the contrary, we do uphold the law. But we'll, what we're upholding, what he's saying, is we're upholding Jesus. Jesus was the law, fulfilled, completed. And we're missing that if we don't look at Jesus and we only look there. So then he goes in in chapter 4 and he says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather? Guys, you got to keep in mind that Abraham was the, the main icon. He was the main man, the, the father of their faith. Abraham, that's where the Jewish nation came from. He's the man, right? And so that's why he's using Abraham. He says, For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about. If he did it through himself, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Believing righteousness. Believing righteousness. That's what creates the righteousness, is believing. And here's the kicker, though. He says, now to the one who works... His wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. He earned them. Naturally, he's going to get them. He earned them. That's what's, 
That's what you do. You work, you get paid, right? They were so caught up in believing that you have to work in order to earn this thing that he had to break it down and even show that Abraham didn't have to work for it to get righteousness, the father of their faith. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That's awesome. Just as David also speaks of the blessings of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. So he lays out that Abraham didn't have to work for it. He also brings up that David even clearly said that it was righteousness for those who didn't have to work for it. He says, blessed are those who didn't have to. Now, how can we be good but not proud and holy and still humble? God's solution is righteousness of faith, by faith. We can't brag if we didn't earn it, right? So we would all be self-boasting. We would all be proud. We would all be puffed up if we could earn it. God says, His Word says that He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If He opposes the proud, why would He put something into play that's going to make you naturally proud of yourself, of what you've done? He wouldn't. He makes it to where you can't. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. He just, he was talking to me there. He said, Nathan's blessed because his lawless deeds are forgiven. You can insert your own name if you feel that that applies. And whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That's in Psalms 32, I believe. That's pretty awesome. That comes out of Psalms. That's pretty stinking awesome. It says, Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? That's a really great question, Paul. Was it before or after he was circumcised? It was before. He had faith before. The circumcision was simply the sign of that faith that God is who God says he is. That's the sign. I believe this is my outward sign that shows that I believe. You can't be counted righteous just because you get the sign if you don't believe. That's not what gives the, the righteousness. That's just a sign. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. I love that. The purpose was to make him the father of all who would believe without being circumcised. So that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the four steps of the faith that their father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So that's why he's called the father of their faith. That's why. We put so much, so much emphasis on Abraham, Father Abraham has many sons. Many sons has Father Abraham. Okay. This is a great song, right? Exactly. He's the father of our faith. But why? It's the father of our faith. Of our faith. Guys, this is, this is so key. And I know that so many of us, like we've heard it, we hear it, we know it, we understand, yeah. But who in here has still said, who, who puts this yoke back on of sin that weighs them down, and they think that they have to overcome this, that they have to overcome it. I just, I just have to do this one thing. I just have to do this thing to get this off of me. I just have to do this one thing because I deserve to go through this. I deserve to go through this because I was wrong. 
because I'm sick, I'm twisted, I'm whatever. I deserve this. I need to be punished. No, you don't. No, you don't. The punishment was taken. The punishment was taken. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve it anymore because the word says that he's made your most, uh, that your most righteous deeds are as unfilthy, uh, are as filthy rags. But his blood, the sacrifice that God sent Jesus, that shedding of his blood where it poured out, he took the beating. You think you deserve a beating? He took it. You think you deserve to be whipped? He took it. You think you deserve to get smacked in the mouth? He took it. He got his beard ripped out. He got punched in the face. You think you deserve to be spit on? He took it. He took it. He took it. And literally, the only thing that he asked in return is to believe in my son. Believe that he is God. That he is me. Jesus told Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, look at me. All you have to do is believe. You just have to believe. And then by that believing, like, don't... So many people get it twisted. They're like, well, yep, I believe. Boom. Well, and then they say, well, I, they say I believe. If you believe, if you believe, if you believe and you know Him and you know His love for you and you know His passion for you, you know His drive and His desire for you, you're going to be pulled into that like a magnet, like a tractor being sucked right in. And then you're going to change. It's going to change you. You're not going to change you. It's going to change you. That's why He says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then you're going to see all these changes. You're going to see them because you put Him first. You seek Him first. He's the most important, more important than anything else. And whenever you're so wrapped up and consumed in Him, He overflows out of you. And those changes naturally happen. They naturally happen. They're overflowing because he's pouring into you and the bad flows out. He takes it away and then he's pouring into you because you're seeking him and you're like, I want more, I want more, I want more. And he's like, you're getting it. <laughs> you're going to get it. I'm pouring it in. And then that, go that bad is gone and so what naturally overflows is just his goodness, his kindness, his gentleness, his love, his mercy. All of the fruits of the Spirit just start pouring out of you. You are no longer who you were, but you've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you that lives, but he that lives in you. Because you just give up yourself. You say, you know what? You're so much better than me. You're so much better than what I could possibly do, what I could possibly present to anybody or anything. You're so much better. So all I want is you. And he says, I'm giving it. I'm giving it. I'm giving it. I love this. You want more of me, but guess what? I want more of you. I've wanted more of you from the very beginning. I've been waiting for this. This is my gift. It's his Father's Day when you come to a full relationship with him and you surrender yourself and you say, you know what? I don't want anything other than you. He says, that's the best gift you could ever give me. You know, he literally, the word says that he was sitting in the courts of heaven and he said, let us go make a dawn. Let us go make man in our image and in our likeness. Because he wanted to. He wanted to. He wanted you exactly you. That's amazing. It's incredible. Doesn't get any better than that. This promise is realized through faith as we continue on through chapter 4. Verse 13, it says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring, and his offspring, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. He told Abraham, You are going to inherit the world. Your offspring will inherit the world. All of it. You're going to get it all. 
Not because you keep this law perfectly, but because of faith, the father of our faith. Four, if it is the adherence of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null or is, is not necessary. And the promise, that would mean that that promise that he just made to Abraham is void. It's void. It doesn't even matter anymore. For the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. Jesus fulfilled the law. Remember that. He fulfilled the law. He took your transgressions, your sin, your shame. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be granted to all of his offspring, not only the inherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Have you ever heard of the Jewish nation? It's a nation, but he is making him the father of many nations through faith. That's how. Absolutely incredible. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. He gives life to the dead. You know what? We were all dead in our sins because the wages of sin is death. But he gives life to the death. He gives life to the dead. <laughs> oh, I love it. The God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Have you ever felt like you want to be something. You want to be somebody. You want to be more like God. You want to be more righteous. You want to be more holy. You want to be more pure. But you're like, I'm just not. Well, he calls it into existence and makes it real. You know, he spoke and created the world. He spoke and created light. He spoke and created water. He spoke and created you. He spoke and breathed the breath of life into you because he's a creator. And he spoke into existence the things that were not, that are. So if you want to be more like something, you want to be less like something, you want God to create something in you, then ask and he will. Ask and he will. Speak it yourself too, because you are made in the image and the likeness of God. He's a creative God. And if you're like him, then you're a creative person. So speak life. If you speak death, you better expect death. If you speak life, expect life. Expect those good changes, but you better start speaking them out. In hope, he believed against hope. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. Anybody seen a hundred year old person have a baby? Me neither, but I've heard about it right here since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. What's funny is God told him, you're going to have kids. And he's like, okay, that's cool. Let's, okay, I believe you. Sarah, Sarai, on the other hand, not so much. She got there. She got there. Look, if God makes it happen, he makes it happen. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what roadblocks are in the way. He'll move whatever he wants to move in order to get you where he wants you to go. And that's exactly what he did here. So, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Do you notice how he grew strong in his faith? He gave glory to God. You want to grow strong in your faith? Give glory to God. That's what Abraham did. You want to grow strong? Give glory to the one who can make you strong. Glory to the God, the creator of the universe, the lover of your soul. It says that he gave glory to God. That is so awesome. And that's how he grew strong in his faith. It says that he was fully convinced 
that God was able to do what he had promised. He, he didn't need to be confident that he could do what he could do in his own power. He was just confident that God could do what he promised. That's all. He was just confident in that. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. That's exactly what Paul was talking about. That's why it was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours. I love how Paul lays this out. He says it was counted to him as righteousness. This wasn't just for Abraham. This was for you and 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 for me and for all the rest of you. That's, that's what he's doing here. He's laying this out so that we can be strengthened in our faith. That's why. So awesome. <clears throat> it will be counted to us who believe in Him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our, trans, our, our trespasses and raised for our justification. So, let's break down that last, that last verse real quick. It says, who was delivered up for our trespasses. Delivered up for our trespasses. Delivered up. Handed over to the enemy. To the one that was going to dish out the punishment. You know, the punisher. Jesus was handed over. And we think, well, man, how would a loving father hand over their one and only son. And we think, he must have went kicking and screaming. Who else is going to purposefully walk into that? No. Jesus loves you so much that he willingly said, no, 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 no. Nathan's not taking that. I'm taking it for him. The father allowed it. The Word says that He was crucified before the foundations of the world were created. The Father allowed it. But Jesus, Jesus wanted you so much too. Remember, God said, let us go make man in our image and in our likeness. And Jesus said, absolutely, let's do this. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters of the deep. <laughs> so He's telling the Holy Spirit and Jesus, let's go make man in our image. Jesus wasn't just handed over, kicking and screaming. The Father didn't tie him up. That's not how it was. He willingly laid himself down. It's almost like Abraham and Isaac. You know, we don't read anywhere where Isaac was kicking and screaming. Abraham said, this is what has to happen. He says, have faith that our God will provide. Jesus was that sacrificial lamb that actually was sacrificed. He was the one that was provided in our stead. We were the ones laid on that altar, deserving to die. And Jesus says, no, I got this. I want this. I will take it because if you read in uh, John 17, it says that we glorify Jesus. We glorify Jesus. He loves us. He wants this relationship. If any of you any of you that are parents especially, if you knew that your child had to be brutally tortured and murdered, would any of you let them walk up there and take it if you could step in their place and take it? I can guarantee you none of my kids are going. I'll take it. Gladly. Gladly. It says, for the joy that was set before him, you are the joy that was set before Him. He was looking at you. He was looking at you. I, I just think that's so absolutely incredible. So He was delivered up for our trespasses, what we deserved. And He was raised to life for our justification. He didn't stay on the cross. He didn't stay in the tomb. We were justified because He was raised back to life. Did you know that the Word says that the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead in that tomb lives and is alive in you if you accept the Holy Spirit? That's incredible. Woo! 
Woo! Woo! <laughs> what? Yeah, that's incredible. So I just love that, man. The very last part. Who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. We were justified through faith in Jesus. Believing that Jesus is who he says that he is. That he will do what he says that he will do. And you can't earn it. You can't. Seek him and let his life flow through you. You will no longer be who you think that you are now. Let that old man die. Let it die. And be raised to new life in Christ. If you guys, if anybody in here hasn't accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, and you want to do that, and you want us to walk through that with you, we will absolutely gladly walk through that with you. Love to. There's zero better decision that you could make. No better decision that you could possibly make than to let him live through you. Incredible. If you haven't and you want to, please feel free to come up here. We'd love to talk with you more about it. You can call us if you're watching online. You want to reach out to us online. You can feel free to do that. Um, the office will put you in touch with us or whatever. And um, that would be super fun. But guys, we, we love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you, God. Thank you for making us. And uh, let's just pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you that you made the way where there was no way. Thank you that you gave us the way to come to you, Lord. You allow us to be able to enter into a relationship with you, God. Not into a religion with you, but into a relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that you have made the way where there was no way. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, focused on you, Lord. Help us to seek you first in your righteousness, knowing that your son, Jesus, and what he did is what truly makes us righteous. Lord, root yourself deep down in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, that you will just work in us, that you will come in us, that you will dwell inside us, Lord. That what we see is what you want us to see. What we hear is what you want us to hear, God. What we speak is what you're speaking through us, through your Holy Spirit, God. Holy Spirit, we invite you today. Lord, and I just pray that, that you will just wash all of our sins away, Lord, and make us as pure and white as snow, God. Help us to accept you, Jesus, and what you've done for us, the works that you've done for us, the sacrifices that you've made for us. And help us, God, to come boldly into your throne room, rejoicing and singing praises because of the awesome and amazing things that you've done for us. You have saved us and taken us from death to life. God, help us to always remember that. Help us to never forget that. Help us to always remember the sacrifices that you've made so that we can have this relationship with you, Lord. We love you very much, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.